And then I remember that the New Forest is well over a thousand years old, so I think they've got a long time before the signs get to go down. Why is this evening on for me? Well, apart from the fact I've just come out of Easter, which for a Royal Palace food historian is rather a busy time, and over the last five days I've given 96 talks on the history of, of short, only about 11, 12 minutes, on the history of raw chocolate. My brain is fried. I'll answer any question later, I don't care anymore. Little talks like this I rather like because they take me out of my comfort zone. Normally I'm talking to disparate audiences about the work you do and very focused on one project. I have to have a good think about this evening. I realise that you're not an ordinary audience. I mean, it's a normal. You have particular interest. I realise that the other people here, I wanted to do my best not to talk about anything that they were going to mention. So I'm really pleased I don't have asparagus to talk about. I wanted to sort of give you, I mean, I'll quite quick, a little cavalcade from what I do from the point of view of projects, and then the puzzle of the writers who people. Then that's the time to talk. So I say, please, anything occurs to you, do ask me afterwards. I'm very happy with all that. Want to protect my, do you like my little garden as well? That's a little 14th century um, vegetable garden. I have no idea what any of the uh, things growing there doesn't tell you. What on earth does a royal palace food historian do? Well, the historic royal palaces are the six, I've just learned to say that, we had five till last week, the six. Six royal palaces which the Queen owns but happens to choose not to live in. So we are given them to curate. Our curator's department, most well known as someone already asked tonight, is Lucy Worsley, who's part of my department. My bit's very small because I'm supposed to look at, here it comes, this is why I'm still here, the history of our monarchy and the people who live within their palaces through their food. So that's absolutely everything. Spread over over a thousand years of history. So one week or one year, a few years ago, I could be looking at the coronation and weddings, things like that, royal weddings. I had to do a project on the royal wedding cake in 1953 and what made it unusual during wrapping time. And then a month later, I could be whisked off to grub around up some chimney in the tower to try and find out if there's any evidence for a normal cookery at the uh, Tower of London and everything in between. The reason I'm still in my job is because my job changes every six months, so I just have to sit still as a new job comes past. That's <laughs> rather nice. It also means things get a bit scatty, because I do all sorts of uh, work. And in fact, what I do mostly is not work at all. I do this. I talk about what I should be doing. <laughs> Our job in the palaces, and I'm based at Hampton Court, is very simple. I'm supposed to take fact and fiction and see if I can separate the two. What, what is actually real, what might be real, what is hearsay, what is legend, what's come down to us. I'm very happy with these two. Well, which one's the real head of the eight? I don't know. <laughs> I like to think that sat on his cloud somewhere, Henry rather likes this one. Thinking, I'm a fit guy at last on TV. I'm fed up with all the other representations of me. And he was. Apart from Mr. Reese Myers, he's a good foot too short. He did look more like him than the famous Fat Henry, which is the last few years of his life. So it's unpicking stories is most of what we do. I don't get to do it upstairs in the pretty bits of any of the palaces. I am stuck, happily so, down in the kitchens, looking after all that is to do with food. One of my fascinations is the anthropology of dining and food service. And I always point out that Cantor and Gorgians as educated themselves that eating is what we do when we're hungry. Dining has nothing to do with that. Dining is all about pomp and circumstance. It could be about religion, it could be about trade, it could be about prejudice. It could be trying to impress or trying to uh, ingratiate all sorts, everything, apart from being hungry. Looking at old kitchens is quite fun. I could probably spend an hour on this, um, this little duck print of a 16th century cookbook kitchen. I've certainly used various bits from it over the years. We have so far at our palaces managed to reconstruct to a working level a number of kitchens. Most famous is the one that uh, we're now well known for, the Tudor kitchens at Hampton Court. They are operational in the way. They are the original space that cooked 
both of them to Fortress NV8, and they are doing so once more on a very, very small experimental scale. Last year, I came to the end of two years um, putting back together the kitchens of George III at Kew. If you haven't been down to see those, they're well worth a look. They're only open from March till September. Give us a call and have a professional look around those. They are really interesting. They are, that's the passage right there, they are state of the art for 1720. Better than that, no one has messed them about. Mm -hmm. They were closed around 1800, so most of the kitchens I've worked in a lot of my life have all been covered about and had a steam table put in and then a rain and so on. These happened, these were shut. So they are pure Georgian cooking space. And as you can see from David there, whipping up whatever he's doing, functioning again once more. And only in February, I acquired kitchen number three. The Royal Chocolate Kitchen at Hampton Court Palace is now once and more open, hence the 96 talks about chocolate and barista in a very, very small space. But this project was uh, brought about by the fact that we had a legend, a story, that uh, George I, whose accession we're celebrating this year, had his own chocolatier, his own chocolate maker, replacing the previous one. The previous one, he had a Mr. Tozia, who made his chocolate. And for me, when I was given the project, the first question was why? Why in 1700 when you can go and buy chocolate in London? Why do you have your own one? What's he doing? Who's he doing it for and where? So it's taken a couple of years to unpick some of that and I still have a few stories to go. I still don't know where they're buying the beans from. I don't know a lot. But it was a, it's been a, a good journey. We're getting there. The byproduct of working in historic kitchens is you get historic meals. And it's great fun. We get lots and lots to eat. I get to taste all sorts of interesting, unusual. I don't think I've ever had anything I didn't like, but I'm a bit, uh, a bit strange like that. So far, in my travels across the globe, I haven't yet found something I won't eat. It's out there, but I don't know what it is yet. Many people try it, and I used to say, no, try that, I quite like it. There are, there are a few things I don't want to get, but I'll eat anything. <laughs> so I'm not always the one to ask when they say, oh, in this case, an early Georgian meal. Is it nice? I used to say, yes. <laughs> Is it, is it all going to be nice? Yes, and so on. So we need somebody else to talk about that. Making these meals is interesting, but what I'm now going to do, this is the awkward part of this evening, is I'm going to try and point out that it's not that easy and we're not doing very well yet. Putting the kitchen together is not too difficult. It's what I've always done as a historian. I'm actually trained in ceramic history. So I've come through history to kitchens, not cooking to kitchens, and sideways. We take the evidence that survives to us. In this case, that is what's left of the uh, Georgian chocolate kitchen, which is an awful lot, when we took all the decks in racking out, right down to tiny little pieces of evidence. That's a cooking pot which hasn't been analysed yet. It's waiting in its little queue. That's come out of a cellar near Liverpool Street, which collapsed during the Great Fire. Now the nice thing, sadly for anyone who's caught in it, it isn't nice, but the nice thing about fires is there are terminal catastrophes, the pot's dirty. It didn't get cleaned up because no one thought their house was going to collapse on it. So we have a selection of about five cook pots from that basement, all of which have the last meal still in them. And that I find quite interesting. That's time to play with a mass spectrometer and see what's in there. You can ask about that as we go on, otherwise I'll ramble on about uh, ancient beers. As well as all the objects, the obvious thing you can go to is pictures. I've got very fond of this book, just lately, because we've been doing a lot of work from it. In fact, I'm cooking from it tomorrow morning for some filming. Mr. Henderson, Henderson's book is filled with uh, fantastic ideas for a, a good meal. But in his frontispiece, if you were looking to put together a kitchen, well, you know, well, this is a very good place to start. It gives you platters, bowls, spits, and where to place them. I don't know the polite way of those, which is pricks. Um, they're for testing the temperature of meat. They're um, atelet, sort of. All these different things put, uh, put out for us to pick apart and start cross-referencing the things you found in the, the physics you have. So all of that I take to a range of craftsmen which at the moment span Britain and North America and have the equipment remade. Because the thing that we're trying to work out is not what all of this food story do. We could all say, I could go grab a book from any century, we could go into that kitchen and 
put together a very tasty meal. We'd all be very happy. But what I'm interested in, to a large point of view, is process. I want to use the same equipment in the same space with the same pitfalls, etc. So what I need, if I'm looking at 16th century or early 17th century cookery, is not aluminium pans, or not even iron ones, but bronze ones. Does that affect the way in which you prepare that meal? Yes, it does, quite considerably, because of the way they conduct heat and because of the problems of early grain. Our knives are all uh, made for us by a cutler, they're iron, not with a steel edge. They're not stainless, they have to be treated differently. They give you insights into natural cleanliness of kitchens. If you have a knife that rusts overnight, then you wipe it dry. You don't leave anything on it, you clean it every time you use it. You clean your board down. It gives you a bit of a view of what went on. And it carries on like that all the way through. That tinware was made for Q because if you know anything about measurements, our points all changed. So our um, measuring cups all have to be made specifically because in the early 19th century, we changed the size of our point from the one the Americans still use to our modern one. So if you take an old recipe and it says a quart, you'll get it wrong if you don't use the old measurements. And that's just for sheer fun. So I just found two glass blowers in Andover who make air twist glasses. And if you want to uh, put some nice jellies and things in something really pretty, it's nice to have someone who can rebuild rather nice glass. Our final port of call for me is not just recipe books, but I'm very lucky because I work in such um, high-end establishments. If I want to recreate not just the kitchen but a meal, Luckily for us, the meals that were served to most of the monarchs are written down every day. It's still happening today. Someone doing my job in a couple of years' time can find out what Her Majesty had for dinner tonight. It will be recorded in some way because it all comes from the civil list and it's all paid for, so it's all written down. So if you want, I don't know what the date that is. That's Her Majesty's dinner. This one is about 1717, it's one I'm working from at the moment. I can not just say they were eating things like this. I can pull it apart and say, on this day, the following was served. Isn't that interesting? Because, interesting enough for the gentleman there, a lot of things are out of season. <laughs> because they're rich. Most of what we hold dear at the moment is the reverse for the past. If I could dig up a Tudor, a Jordan, and a Stuart, defrost it, take him out to some rather nice restaurant near here, and say, it's going to be really great tonight. It's all seasonal and local. They'll look at me and go, so your garden is not very good? <laughs> because when it's uh, difficult to get their vegetables out of season, when most people live a seasonal life, then you don't want to if you have money. If you, have money. you want to use hotbeds for the fourth gun, to put a mushroom book on that, that teach you how to grow lettuces in November by raising up the bed and warming up the earth and protecting them without glass, as if still doing all that. Our vine keeper at Hampton Court has a little notebook left over from centuries ago that tells her how to get grapes onto the Christmas table. So to store them in a dark room in little pottery test tubes so that you can have cheese and grapes on Christmas Day because you're rich. That's the whole point. When you're looking at old food, food miles are incredibly important. The further the better. Because that shows you lots of money. If you want to, I've written that up because those are really difficult to pull out there. Uh, that's the one I'm doing tomorrow, so I thought I'd put that in while I'm working through that one. This is where you get a pitfall with high-end meals. This is what was served to, um, we think only the king, actually. It does say their majesty's dinner, but I don't think they were both sitting down. It's probably just him. On the 6th of February, in this case, it's 1789, that's his lunch. <laughs> and again, that can cause all sorts of confusion, and you get people talking about gluttony and them eating too much. You have to understand what we're seeing. This is not what he's going to eat. This is the menu. The menu is physical on the table, laid before you and your guests to choose from. What you eat is up to you, because that again is the luxury from the past. We're not that far out of having a Britain, let alone half the road, where nobody gets enough to eat. So if you have the money to eat well, how dare you tell anyone what to have? My same person that we just took to this restaurant and said it's seasonal or local. When we sit him down and the first plate comes out, with it all towered up with the onions and the, the sauce around the side, he's going to look at it and go, who's paying for this? You're the chef. Can't I choose how I eat my meal? Can't I have more of the vegetables I like? Can't I have 
more of the sauce on my life and perhaps a different sauce for you. Because that's how it all used to be done. You pick shows so that each diner gets exactly what they want from that table in the way they want, in the order they want. So everything we do now has been reversed. Now I'm going to take that just allows us to uh, have a little go at the meals at Kingsley. That's um, cucumbers a la mapo. I'll do those ones again. They're a stuffed cucumber dish for the time. But again, very popular at the moment. Keep coming across things that are rotating around. Sadly, there is nothing new. And that's what we're going to find out. All of that works. And so now, as I've got a different audience, I'm now going to tell you why it doesn't work as well. Because what we have very big problem doing is sourcing the ingredients. And that isn't sourcing the ingredients in that I can't find where they are. They don't exist like that anymore in a lot of cases. So I can do what I can with what I've got, but every now and then things go wrong. So you're going to get out of a cavalcade up and down where it's worked, not worked, worked and not worked. Some things are simply pushed aside. You might know Fat Hen. We'll come to it again then. Herb that's now wandered off the hedgerows, used to be eaten a lot, or oh, I haven't labelled him. Fat pig, funny though it is, pigs, on, pigs, animals, chickens, they're not the same shape anymore. We have changed the, the shape of all of animals. The big change was the 18th century where they made them all two or three times the size. I spend one week in a year grubbing around in the kitchen rubbish heap at the Tower of London at low tide. I don't know it's down there very often, pulling up all of the bits of cook pot and a lot of <coughs> bones that have been cut up for making marrow and things. They're tiny. The sheep and cattle are much, much smaller. So I can't taste that meat of the past. I have diaries from soldiers at the Tower in just before the Napoleonic campaign, and they are moaning in their little journals, lean beef for dinner again, exclamation mark. They don't want lean beef. They want marbled fatty beef. They would find our meat rather odd. So it is a little bit of a problem in that we now realise when you say, can you taste the past? The answer is a bit, but not totally. For that reason, a large number of our projects are simply based on technique. And uh, a couple of people were asking about the, uh, the big fires at Hampton Court. So my poor friend Ross, this is an experiment to try out a design by a Elizabethan courtier called Sir Hugh Platt. He's written one cookbook which you can get in England, which you might have heard, and another one which is almost impossible to get here, but it's very eccentric stuff. And one of the things in there is a multiple branch spit, spit that might allow you to cook um, diverse numbers of birds using the same fuel as you would normally use to cook a small number, I think it's called. So we've got a traditional spit there loaded up, and poor old Ross is trying to turn 24 chickens on Hugh Platt's multiple spit. Because we don't know if anyone ever built it, we wanted to see if it worked. It does, it's pretty good, apart from it's very, very tiring. And it gets through a ton of wood. I don't, that's not meant to that's genuinely, it gets through a ton of wood. So that's a bit of a problem. But that's all about occupants. That's the other one we miss out. When you say what's special, I'm forever getting this. I will get three television, three calls a, year, a week, a month, from a television company saying, oh, we're doing a program, we want something special from the Tudor Court, the Tudor Court. What's really, really special? Roasted beef. No, 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 we want something really, no, believe me, roasted chicken. Do I have people here old enough to remember that chicken was the birthdays of Easter? <laughs> now the ubiquitous food that's bred in the blight of our children was once special. So this is a special dish from the Court of Elizabeth I. It's chicken, roasted. Not boiled, boiled is cheap. Boiled is one pot and one fire. Roasted is me saying, I can afford man and fuel. Our roasting fires, as all roasting fires are, are 70% fuel inefficient. Your guests know that, that's the whole point. So a lot of the luxury is, is, has to be picked apart, has to be analysed. Anyway, my job is to return to some common garden based things. Imagine a world without that lot. That's what I have to do most of the time. These are the favourite American imports, which, for most of our calorie history, are not around. The capsicum pepper, all the chilies and bell peppers and all that lot, which are everywhere. 
do not figure until we decide to eat them when they come over from America. And none of this, um, apart from the turkey, nothing comes over from the Americas very quickly. I don't know why. The first turkey is about 1507. Everything else is treated with suspicion or somewhat worried that it's, um, it's really for native and we shouldn't eat it. So it takes a long time for most of these to get adopted, apart from the turkey. I can only think that they're looking at funny red berries, they well, don't eat those, and they're pulling up roots from the ground. Well, why should I bother with those? There's only a root. And then they turn around the corner and go, dear me, that's a big chicken. And it's straight over again. This one was, as I can, I can put this one, see, I wouldn't normally do this. Something that no one can ever unpick for me is a lot of Far Eastern and um, Asian food. When I've spoken to a group of uh, Indian cooks, I said, what's your traditional food like? And they start describing beautiful. And sometimes we get steaks and curries and so on. I said, yes, yeah, but that curry has potatoes in it, which are South American. So before you had those, what did you use? Oh, and that's got chilies in. They're South American. What did you use before you had those? And that's got tomatoes in. And so on, and, and you get a look of horror from my group. I have no idea what our traditional food is anymore. If anyone can help me, that'd be very interesting. So once we pick those away, we have to start looking for others. Sometimes what you're looking at, like those fires, is actually more complicated than you think. That is just a scoop of sugar. So what, says the world? We all eat too much of it. But the further back you go, the more difficult that becomes to add to your ingredients. We've got a um, 12th century illustration here, uh, somewhere around Iran, Iraq. That's where sugar comes from. It's Persian, around there. That's where the sugar trade starts. All sugar up until the late 18th century is cane sugar. Beet sugar has never been particularly good to, to uh, economic. It's still not viable. It doesn't work really well. Uh, that beet sugar, that cane sugar, grows for most of our human history around the area that we now think of as Iran, Iraq, or a bit out. It is not until us happy Europeans start gaining colonies that we're, that we're looking for places to grow. So we start growing sugar on the West, on the, in the West Indies, other people are growing sugar all over the place. Not only is sugar something you have to buy from the Arabs, <coughs> which then goes to Venice, which then comes to the rest of us, but the production of sugar is rather complex. If you've ever been to a, a sugar refinery, any traditional ones, a few left out in uh, the Middle East, you have to cook the juice to crystallise it. You cook it in a cone mould, you do it several times, double and treble refining it, moving all the impurities upwards. And then when you take those crystals out of this cone shaped mould, you cut off the very tip to sell to your fine clients, the white sugar at the top. Further down, it's going to be a little bit more brown or manky. So just wanting sugar for a 16th or 17th century recipe can take a lot of work. In fact, that, along with its friends, caused me a lot of trouble. As I tracked down a small town in Iran that was still processing sugar from the cane in the mold. Brilliant. So I had six of them sent over. Would you like to be the person who had to go down to the security department of the Royal Palace <laughs> to accept six cone-shaped items in Iran? <laughs> <laughs> they, they wouldn't open the box. I was a bad boy for the day. <laughs> but it changes your appreciation for sugar when you start having to put that much effort into it. We also get problems with words, with etymology, with, with sudden moments of, oh, I didn't really know that. That, our palace photographer is getting a latte for a magazine. It's just a cinnamon stick. That cinnamon turns up in a number. Recipes, it's one of the um, spices of choice. If you can get hold of cinnamon, ginger, and nutmeg, it goes in anything you want to be high end. But they also mention cassia just as much, which people are getting more of a taste. Well, you've always had a taste for it, it's always been used as cheap cinnamon. Most cinnamon flavored biscuits, cinnamon and apple pies, all of those things are, are cassia or cassia bar. There is no gear of bothers to tell you. And yet, in recipes that are 400 years old, they're already saying blend cinnamon and cassia. They're actually, if you put the two together, they are quite different. Cassia smells just like cinnamon until you have cinnamon. Next, <laughs> you realise the two are quite different. Quite a few of our early recipes asked for cassia flour. So 
So we thought, oh, ground up, that's it. Okay, that can go in there. And this is where we had one of those revelation moments because there was a recipe that said put cinnamon and cassia flour into this uh, little tart, this tart. And then uh, it wasn't me, one of my colleagues came over with a recipe saying, here's a fun one. We've been talking to people about the difference between cinnamon and cassia and the fact that the cassia was brown to cassia flour. We put in things. Look at this recipe. It tells you to take cinnamon, ground cassia, and cassia flour. Um, Bummocks, I think is the word we used. And that took six months, another trip to LA, to track down that there are in fact cassia flowers, which you can put in and have another subtly different flavour. So it took us a while to find out what on earth they've been writing about. If you can get hold of them, they are very, they're nice and mild and, and just another, another peg on. Hopefully, with the other gentlemen that are here tonight, lots of these things I used to have trouble getting are slowly coming back to the problem here. Some things I can't get. That is a 17th century interpretation of how musk oil comes out of musk boxes. <laughs> Obviously the people drawing that have not really been over to Asia. And uh, no, it doesn't come out of there. It, uh, it comes more from around the bottom area. And it has to be dead to get the musk gland out of it. Which means that I am left with a no on this one. But there are certain things that I can no longer do. Musk oil appears in a large number of 17th century sweet tarts and pies. Um, it gives, apparently, a very heady flavour. I can't use artificial musk because that doesn't behave the same. It's not really meant for culinary uses, it's for um, perfumes, on the whole. Uh, in perfume, it's meant to um, make chaps go wild, I'll point yeah. to it. Of course it does, that's why they just wear it. So when it comes to the musk gods, I am uh, not supposed to shoot musk. There are not many of them left, and that's one I'm going to have to leave out. And I have a similar problem with this chap. And if you come across ambergris, mm -hmm. I add ambergris tea, which is an incredible sensation. Ambergris, again, are made much of a perfume, and it affects you around, it, it tastes <coughs> around your small centre. There's no real flavour, it just sort of bums around. It again is in a lot of um, 1770 pies, and one of the recipes for raw chocolate I had from 1717 had ambergris oil in there. But my problem with ambergris at the moment is I can't trust its provenance. It can, um, if you don't know what ambergris is, whales sort of spit it up. It's a um, congealed mass from the uh, stomach of a sperm whale. A lot of people now think it grows around the beaks of squid. So the poor old whale's eating a lot of squid, that's a sharp bit, and so this is the body's reaction to protect the gut. And the old sperm whale goes, and it floats up to the surface. What on earth? makes a 17th century sailor in a boat look down and think, ooh, that was not I'll try that. <laughs> We're missing that bit of information. My problem is, uh, New Zealand ambergris is all beach found. So if you actually want ambergris, you can go to New Zealand. By the time it gets here, and we have a big ethical uh, leaning within the palaces, you tend to lose track of it. And it could end up with some Japanese. And they don't tend to wait for it to come out of the way. They have a habit of still getting it out of the way. So I'm stuck with the fact that I can't do that. Unless I go to uh, New Zealand, very happy to. <laughs> I, I'm stuck without a supply of ethical ambergris at the moment because I can't, can't track it enough. You can get it on the beach in Northern Ireland. You can. You can get it on, in Norfolk. <coughs> I have a, uh, the same chap, Ross, he, he goes out every winter. So far, nothing. <laughs> but he knows someone who found quite a large piece. It's more guaranteed down in uh, New Zealand, but uh, you, you can get lucky. You find a big bit, you're made, you've got a summer holiday for, for that year. <laughs> How big is a piece of Well, the last piece that someone found in was about a kilo, and that's a good piece of ground, that's what I'm ask. Join me in the story of failure. You know, many people now know that uh, carrots were mostly served white for many, many centuries. In fact, they grow lots of colours. And in early references to carrots, they talk about them being white and often purple. And that changes the way your meal looks. And so, one of my colleagues elected to grow our white carrots about five or six years ago, to grow our white carrots for us, so that we could have a lovely Christmas table, and I could do one of these talks, and have a lovely meal one. So he grows the white carrots. We want them for the, uh, the Christmas period. So he dutifully does what 
people used to do in the past. He planked them. So he picked up his white carrots and he put them under sods of earth to keep them so they are ready for Christmas. And they came out. <laughs> I think <mean>, on orange. <laughs> it was slightly a disappointing day. <laughs> so it looks a bit like um, peppers and things. The pigment in carrots is sort of latent and they can change colour in storage. Nowadays, most of our carrots aren't grown specifically to be orange, but it looks like there is an orangeness, a pigment within those white ones that if you store them right or wrong, they'll go orange. So that didn't work, did it? <laughs> Some things do. That's our last year's skirret harvest. Skirrets are, are, are our forgotten parsnip. The reason being that parsnips are nicer. And that's the problem with a lot of them these forgotten uh, or stepped over um, ingredients. We're talking about, shall we bring it back, shall we not? In a lot of cases, well, you know, I'm not really sure why we should, because it's not quite as good. So we've got our first crop of skirrets, which is going back in the ground to grow more skirrets, so that we can eventually have a whole row of disappointing parsnips <laughs> to show people when they come along. But there will be dishes that use them, they'll be slightly different, I'm not quite looking forward to them. We're quite keen on bringing back as many um, herbs as, as we can that people have gotten. I mentioned the fat hen at the start, just to use the fat pig joke. Um, fat hens just got lost. It's everywhere. Roadsides. Eddie, it's one of the first plants to come up when you disturb the ground. So uh, a building site, uh, uh, a bit of earth that's been turned over somewhere, up comes the fat hen. What you're missing by not picking it is a, another reasonable salad and quite a good spinach substitute. And I'm told the little um, seeds dry. Is it simple good king hen? No, that's another one. Oh, we'll come to him. Yeah, no, yeah, we, we've got... Uh, uh, savoury seems to have wandered off the list. I'm sure it will be discovered by some high-end friend of one of ours and uh, back it will come. And the one I've been using a lot, just lately, hyssop. I forgot to get a picture of uh, hyssop. Wandered off the list and it's kind of coming back. Beautiful, um, it's a tuna one, yeah, it's a tuna dish which tells you to steam a chicken in wine and hyssop uh, in a cauldron with the lid sealed down with pastry. So basically, it just steams it in there. And now I do my chicken and I steam chicken always with hyssop. And uh, it's, it's, it's so flavours we've missed. There's good King Henry. <laughs> I've just planted a lot. We're going to have a go. With the good King Henry, it didn't work very well last year. I think it was too, it was too wet. Something went wrong. The good King Henry, another of our slightly forgotten um, greenery. The leaves make quite a good spinach, and to pull us, bring us full circle, the young shoots behave a lot like artichoke. They don't go, not asparagus. They are considered poor man's asparagus. So I'm hoping to be able to report back in a couple of months to tell you what they're like. Are they any good? If they're poor man's asparagus, they're probably not as good as asparagus. Which takes some finding in old recipes. It's always written asparagus. All over the world, we a dish of buttered asparagus is always right. There you go. There you go. And then you get reverse surprises. Rocket, I would have put down as one of the um, new tastes of the last 10, 15 years. Suddenly, it must be 10 years ago now, you couldn't move for rocket salads. It seemed to be the, the new. Uh, ingredient. I've got just as many 16th century recipes that tell you to take rocket sat and address it with oil, vinegar, salt and pepper. So it isn't a new one, it's another of those cycles round. It comes back because we've rediscovered it. And then I've got a couple of... I might have used these, I don't know if anyone's used any of these. I like barberries. Barberries are one we need to bring back. Barberries grow around the uh, Mediterranean area, Turkey, places like that. Those happen to be Iranian ones, so they're coming back into Britain. They're a little raisin-like fruit um, with quite a tart taste. They were only ever seen here, you could never get them fresh, we possibly could now. They were only ever seen here dried because of the, the distances. But Barbary tarts and Barbary forms and so on are lovely. It's another, another fruit taste that we're missing. And this one makes me laugh. I don't know if anyone's come across wolfberries. You might know them by their new name. The wolfberry appears in certainly 17th century English cookery and the 18th. Again, a tart little berry. You get them in all the health food shops at the moment. Goji. Goji. Yes, goji berries. Goji berries, which do grow in Tibet, grow in Britain. Apparently there are a lot of wolfberry or goji berry plants up the A1. <laughs> so if you don't want to pay how much you're paying for goji berries, 
they are not so much a superfood as up the A1, <laughs> help yourself. <laughs> I need to finish off. We'll return to the wonderful capsicum family. Now, I'm a fan of chilies, not too hot. I like my spice to taste, not blow my head off. I like my spice in the right place. I have an absolute fascination for trying to put the right ingredient into the right dish. So, I will put chilies into anything Mexican that I'm making, but I won't put it into Indian food. I'll use ginger and garlic for that. What do you do before this wonderful weed came wandering into Europe? Because capsicums will grow in here, that's, that's why they're so successful. From the hottest to the mildest, it doesn't really matter, you can just grow them. Well, sadly, what we've lost is a, uh, a range of black peppers, which I use because I know about them, and I think we should use a lot more. We have black pepper, which is the black pepper seed, mm. one we're all used to. Another of its var variants is the long pepper, like a long one. But it looks like a catkin because the seeds are so tight onto it about an inch long, grind them up to release the pepper, put them in a mill, and you've got not just a pepper, but the long pepper is very, quite, um, it numbs the mouth. It's a tingling. They shiz one, one pepper. Huh? They shiz one pepper. Not as so strong. Not it's as a strong berry, as isn't it? It's a session pepper, I think it's a berry. It's a berry. It, is. Mm. it has the same numbing effect, but it's nowhere near as strong. The long pepper is in my first ever curry recipe which is mid 18th century, it says how to make curry, but this time the Indian way. I've got to look into that one a bit more. And that has a blend of peppers and doing a lot of long pepper into it. It's got quite a spicy taste with a, a numbing effect. The extra heat in that curry dish is provided by these little West African peppers, um, known originally as guinea peppers, but guinea is just the English word for foreign, I don't know where it comes from and also later known as grains of paradise that's ate by them today. Get some, grind them up, make a pepper blend, a black pepper, long pepper, put in some grains of paradise. They're fiery, they're hot and fiery with a completely different note. And if you want to really mix things up a bit, stick some cubebs in, Japanese long-tailed black peppers. They're floral, they're pungent, they have another flavour range. So sadly, from my point of view, what's happened with bringing the capsicums in is we've forgotten about a raft of beautiful peppers that we should be using as well. And the long pepper is one of my oldest recipe pieces and could send us off in some very weird ways because I belong that the long pepper is the pepper that the Romans are bringing into Britain. So if we went off down the rear copies of the Romans, we'd be looking at silver weed, which is even worse as a um, root than the uh, skirits. It's not. It's a little tiny weed. The flower in the middle is just to make the picture interesting. The silver weeds around it. Um, it has a silver on the underside of the leaf, that's how you can spot it when the wind blows. A little tiny root that just looks like a dandelion root was eaten in Britain when the Romans came in and they very rightly ignored it. And so <laughs> Roman cookery would send us off into a weird, wonderful world. And I thought I had to include a picture from a Roman pop up restaurant I ended up at last year where everything was cooked from a selection of Roman poems, not the famous pieces but other things. But returning to where I started, reconstructing old kitchens and stuff, it's a serious job, we're looking at techniques, we're trying to unpick the past, we're trying to see if techniques can be recreated and learned from, if new, flavor, new old flavours can be redone. It has allowed me, that's many years ago, to have an awful lot of interesting historic meals. I'm learning to buckle is that the correct word for being a butler? There, <laughs> at the Earl of Harwoods, at the same time we create a, a, a Victorian tea. So if you're passing any of that palaces, that's one of our visits, or any of the others, maybe you'll pop in, say hello, and I'll be in there trying to separate fact from fiction and learning, <laughs> and learning new things. Thank you very much. you for hundreds of questions. <laughs> Can I answer any? Oh, yeah. That's one. We're going to find some lights and things. I don't know why. Do you know why barbering is growing in this country anymore? Um,
the little bit I can remember is it doing with their problem in wheat. Exactly. Yeah, so yeah. uh, they might be growing it because it's actually a carrier. Yes, no, they were completely exterminated. Yes, yeah. and that's uh, earlier than that. That is the reason why several things aren't grown in various places, like gooseberries and all the Rybans family are not grown in the United States except in one specific place because they have a host that can destroy whole forests in white fur. Well, now we, we are able to move things around, so um, I'm fine with happy using it. I'm not just saying you should grow them again, although we might be able to eradicate yes. that, but uh, bring them in. Um, importation is a, uh, an interesting and uh, complicated thing to discuss we've gone for hours about whether it's better to fly a bean from uh, Kenya or burn fossil fuels in a uh, greenhouse in Norfolk. Yes. We can talk about that for ages. Yes. Uh, uh, Chairman uh, first. Uh, bring me back to the old fashioned way of cooking. Mm -hmm. Where is the most challenging for you? What is, because obviously health and safety today they are a pain in the ass, but we don't say that. No. Uh, um, so where, where is the challenging? No, I don't actually think any of it is particularly challenging. Um, it's time consuming. The cookery is very, very labour intensive, but I don't think that any of those labours are particularly complex. I mean, when I, I worked on that last picture of the Victorian Mill now, I used to work for the Duke of Northumberland at Science. Some of the uh, Victorian dinners that we recreated from his family members take days. But what was the taste of it? The taste is gorgeous. I mean, the taste of the latest stuff is high end French uh, cuisine. Um, eating a canal of chicken that's been poached in white wine and truffles is rather nice. I'm sure some of you've done it. Pushing that raw chicken through a sieve is not a difficult, not a nice job to do, but a monkey can do it. <laughs> it is just that. It's, it's sheer, sheer manpower and hours. I can't think of anything immensely. Uh, I mean, some. Uh, I think our main problem is I'm working on a jigsaw where someone's thrown the lid away. So often I will find out halfway through doing something because that that was the better way to do it. I've worked on roasting for the last few. Before I went to Kew, I've done uh, quite a number of years working on Henry VIII's roasting fire. So that's my main subject, and it, it was slowly working out the things that the man who's supposed to teach you is dead would have told you in one day. Don't stand there. Don't do that. Change the speed here. Change that. And so on. So it's um, and some a lot of it. I'll never, some things you'll never find out. Mm. The other question is uh, because of time, uh, you're making the food. Yes. Uh, it's a perishable goods. Mm -hmm. So how do you store it? Uh, how do you deal with that? Uh, if it's for if it's for public consumption, if I'm doing something like meal, then I have to follow modern protocol. Oddly enough, um, we the only one or the two places we have period stores left are Q and Hampton Court. The stone stores at Hampton Court, which are down a passage known as Fish Court now, which is called kind of Post Space, I've had a thermohydrograph in two of those, so measuring the humidity and temperature, now for just under two years. Apart from a small heat wave in June 2012, they have remained legal as food storage. They have made, they remained under 80 degrees. When we were setting up this evening, um, the chef chap is famous to come and talk to you once he's got it all. Today, he wants perfection for you, just good for um, He asked me for various dishes and things, and uh, uh, everything I provided was too high end and too meat filled because it's all well cooked. <laughs> so they settled on the idea of this salamagundi, which is a mixed salad thing that seems to have lots of history and none. It suddenly appears in the, uh, the end of the 17th century, fully formed. Um, there are those who say it's a bastardisation of a French word, meaning uh, mixed together. Yeah, I'm not sure. It might even be an older English word. We have most of our languages mixed with French for centuries before that. It certainly means mixed together. Um, the word hotchpotch is used in equal measure for, for a similar sort of dish. So it, it's a the chef's best mixed together of things he's got in a nice order for you, usually based around a salad. Um, often, uh, again, the historic of course, a salad has to have meat in it or fish in it, because what's the point of the health? Uh, from what I understand, he's done two, hasn't he? He's done two. He's done one following. I sent him a selection of recipes, and I think he picked Hannah Glass, which is a nice, easy one to work from. 
and then he's also had his own go. Like what you would do if you invented some of the Gumby now, how would it turn out? So I'm fascinated to see the difference between a uh, early 18th century mixed salad. We're just taking a photo. Okay. It's before it actually gets presented, yeah. but um, they are ready. Old American um, successor, but don't be like the first year. It's not the first successor, it's the first in America. Yeah. So you can talk us through what's I've mentioned the middle of the background of Sullivan and I've told nothing about what you've done. So I know I'm so this is the more classic version. Um, it's a little gaudy. <laughs> but um, basically, there's a base of chopped chicken. Um, so what we've done with this chicken is we've actually done it in the water bath, quite low, about 68, um, to replicate the kind of paper chicken. We've also done something similar with our chicken from the modern version, but I'll take through that when that comes out. Um, so that's why this chicken is quite kind of... Um, it's almost sort of pink in colour. It's not been cooked for a long time at low temperature, rather than it's, uh, you know, uh, it's not properly cooked. It's just a clear up. So on top of that, there is then some chopped egg whites, which are hard boiled, um, and they are just um, classically grilled. Um, and then on top of that, we've actually done the yolks at a, at a bit of a high temperature, at 70 degrees, uh, rather than making them grain, because we just, even though we know it's classic, we thought, mm, it's just not that pleasant. Really. So then there is roasted spinach, there's chopped sorrel, there's a lot of acidity, or should be here actually, so um, there's chopped up pulp of lemon, uh, which is literally just raw, the original recipe in hand glass had it effectively just raw lemon. Um, yeah, the sorrel. Um, there's a dressing, which is like a vinaigrette made with olive oil. Um, there's chopped ho uh, grated horseradish. Uh, there is also barberries. Um, yeah, <laughs> so how I mean, at that time would it have been common to have a big grow here? It is grow here at the time. People just saying cultivating the grow more um, And then there's also um, edible flowers and uh, raw lemon, raw uh, orange as well. Oh, and also anchovies. So there's so much stuff going on around here. It's, it's absolutely crazy how much stuff there is. Our version is probably slightly more restrained, I think. But we've been a bit more technical about the way we've prepared some things and some flavours that we've chosen to marry. So we hope it's going to be a little bit more balanced. Um, but yeah, we've got three of these. There's actually quite a lot of sausage on here. So do yeah, take, take some. Very much. Uh, it's the same very, story. very much the same. Do you want to go to the bottom? I'm going to try and describe to you what's in here, but it's incredibly hard to remember it all. From the very bottom, you have uh, chicken legs that have been cooked sous vide. They've been seared in a little bit of butter. On top of that, if I remember right, there are Cornish cultures, which have been, yeah. you know, uh, Asian. Yeah. They're really, really good. Um, they are, there are some charred shallots. There are uh, olive oil confit lemon. There is uh, fermented radishes, kind of made by Mike about a week ago, which have had a number of things done to them. I'm going to say them all. Um, <laughs> that might come I think there's it. also pickles that you've made. So That's great. Right. Sort of Lactic dill pickles. Yeah, this is everything that we're interested in all in one place. And the elderberries. <laughs> um, elderberries, yes. Yeah, fermented the elderberries. Really the most interesting thing on here, actually. Almost all the vegetables, except the stuff on the very top, is fermented. <laughs> if you want to know any more, please do, but don't worry about it too much. Um, barberries. Yeah. Uh, the little red bits of barberries. They were all still in the old one. They're um, delicious, though. They're really much fun to play for Micro um, watercress? Yes. Yeah, micro so, Yeah. So this is kind of where cultivation is kind of at the bijou end of things now, I suppose, isn't it? It's basically like, how can we make a perfect, tiny, you know, thing? So there's a mixture of, of the wild and the kind of non on here. Um, and there's what, fennel, red vein, sorrel, um, watercress, but all yeah. kind of micro vegetables. <laughs> there's also sorrel. Oh, and the egg yolk? There's an emulsion of egg yolks. A little bit of water. And again, get the almost almost like two inches of egg yolks that have been cooked at 62 degrees. Uh, Loosen up some water. There is, oh, there's one more touch. Yeah. Which is uh, homemade vinegar infused with juniper wood. Which is the best smell in the whole wide world. 
um, which I'm going to spray it now. And I'll leave it here if anybody wants to have a go on it and give it a spray. It's really, really sour because it's making very, very strong spirit in it, but it does not. So if anybody would like to. I wish I could say to you, it took a week, but actually, we didn't really know what we were doing when we started plating it. So these are all elements that we know, but we don't know this dish very well. If I was uh, reimagining how to do this dish, I, I don't know how long it would take to do this. If you wanted to kind of test it out a bunch of times, we did this. The other thing is that you can keep your and this, so you, you need time, you know. Just, so you just under a year. Yeah, okay. that's because true. the green elderberries on here were picked obviously just before they uh, turned and became the elderberries that you know, and then they were salted for how long? Six weeks. Yeah, and then the, then taken out of brine and then packed with vinegar. Right. So they've been aging really for about ten months. Sorry, um, that answers your question much better. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's the, the most pilchers. We don't know how shallow you need to be then. You're straight. Very, very, very committed to me. Yes. Yeah. Yeah.